Well, good day, everyone. I know I usually say good morning, but it's not morning for everyone uh, who's participating in uh, this prophecy conference. Now, for those who haven't looked at the schedule change, um, Iran has presented all the material that he had prepared, and I'm going to continue with his study addressing the symbolic use of numbers. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence here. You know, Lord, that there is much light that you have given us, and we are thankful for this light, but it is a lot for us to behold. And I just ask, Lord, as we continue this study on the symbolic use of numbers, that you can give me wisdom uh, to bring these things together to help us to understand how to use these tools and that we can spend time examining uh, this light, comparing it with scripture, knowing that you are leading, and we pray for each person who is searching, that they can know your presence and your comfort. We invite your Holy Spirit to instruct us here, to correct us, and to guide us. And we pray this, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So when we're addressing the symbolic use of numbers, and, and I have mentioned it in some of my presentations, we're not using numerology. That is, there is a thing called astronomy, and there's a thing called astrology. Both use the stars and the planets. Um, God has given us the sun and the moon and the stars um, as for signs, for seasons, for days and years. But we are not in control of them. God is. He's the one who sits enthroned, who rules over all things. Yet man thinks that they can control God. And that's astrology. That they can predict the future and control their own destiny. Numerology does the same thing. It uses what God has given, mathematics, numbers, geometry, and mixes it with other types of mysticism. What's that? They can't hear you, apparently. So you can't hear me? Now I can. Now okay. we can. I thought it was me, but it seems that there's other people that can hear me. Okay. So nobody heard my no. prayer or anything I said? No. Okay, well, let's do that over again. <laughs> let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, we are thankful that we are here this morning and we invite your presence. Um, thank you for each of the people, each of the, those that are listening, and uh, we pray that you can help the equipment to work so that they can hear. We need ears to hear, and hearts to understand. We just pray, Lord, that as we enter into this study that your Spirit's presence can be here to instruct us, to correct us, and that you can be with each person searching for truth. So we ask that you can be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. So sorry about that false start. What what was happening with the sound? I think I just forgot to unmute the Ah, okay. Okay, so you can see here that I'm presenting the symbolic use of numbers. Iran has completed his material, and I'm going to try to bring some of the things together that we have been using, uh, the different tools, and uh, so that's what we're going to be doing uh, this morning and tomorrow morning. I'm going to be doing that as well. Now, I did want to talk a little bit about the symbolic use of numbers, that it is not numerology. Now, I made a comparison between um, astrology and astronomy. So God has given us the sun and the moon and stars 
as a calendar in the sky. And astrology tries to manipulate God, manipulate their own destiny by predicting what's going to happen in the sky. And I've talked about before how the astrologers in, in the Babylonian court, uh, what they were trying to do was manipulate the king because they would know when a lunar eclipse would occur, but the king didn't know how they came about that knowledge. And so to him, they were magicians, right? They were magical. They could say on such and such a day, uh, there's going to be uh, a full moon, or not a full moon, but an eclipse of the moon, or there could be an eclipse of the sun, or some other kind of astronomical phenomena would appear. And, and, and this would be a good day to have a battle or not have a battle. I could never quite understand why, uh, if there is an eclipse of, of the moon, let's say, why that would be a good sign for you and a bad sign for the enemy or the other way around, because it's going to be, for both people, the eclipse is going to occur. But for some reason, you know, uh, what's auspicious for you um, is, not, is supposed to be bad for the other guy, but they might think it's good for them and bad for you. So it, it's never really quite made sense to me how people uh, use astrology. Yeah, it's a superstition. So what we're doing with numbers is analyzing the stories of Scripture with tools that God has given us as symbols. So when we deal with a symbol, many Seventh-day Adventists can accept that 70 years is a symbol. 70 weeks is a symbol. So that when Jerusalem is destroyed in 70 AD, they would say that that is prophetically significant. And yet they're using a Roman calendar that is going to give us this year 70 AD. So, so they accept that idea that numbers are symbols. They'll accept the idea that uh, the Sabbath, the seventh day cycle, is a symbol. And then when we see it in Scripture, things happen in cycles of seven, that that's a symbol of completeness. That eight is the number of the resurrection. The 12 is the number of the church. The 3 is the number of unity, right? So we have all of these symbols in Scripture, and they exist in these stories. So when there's 153 fish, um, when uh, Peter throws out his net and captures these fish, it's significant, right? And it's, and it's written there in Scripture. These things exist in Scripture. Now, some of these things, like Bible verses... Those have been added by man. They're not part of God's word originally. And yet we find that there are symbols in the numbers and the verses of Scripture. Then we also have um, the Hebrew, the Strong's numbers, which we're going to look at. Uh, these were created by Strong. I can't remember his first name. Uh, but, you know, he, he had put together this uh, concordance and then he use numbers uh, to record the, the, in the dictionary. They numbered the words in the dictionary so he could cross-reference them. And, and this is created by man. Yet we find in these numbers, in these stories, as we lay them out a on a line, that these symbols mean something. They give us information. What, what is it? James, James Strong, yeah. That's, I think that's the first time I ever thought about his first name, at least in a long time. So James Strong's uh, uh, concordance. And, you know, there's another guy who made a concordance, Cruden, and there's another concordance, Young's, right? So all of these people have had uh, an influence on how we can search in the words of Scripture. So what we're doing is not numerology. We're not trying to manipulate God. We're just analyzing what God has given us in the scriptures. Now, when it comes to dates, dates are symbols. Now, we know in the book of Ezekiel, there are 13 dates recorded. Four of those dates are the same dates that are on the line that we talked about from 2016. So this line here,
where you got the first day of the first month, so this is April 19 in 1844, and the fifth day of the fourth month, that's July 21, and then the first day of the fifth month, that's August 15th, and then the tenth day of the seventh month, October 22, these are symbols. And these, these dates here on the biblical calendar, so we can, we can look at this as the first disappointment, right? We call this midnight, but this is Boston. And I did write a paper on this, on these, these dates, and this is Exeter. Because, you know, we conflate these two events. So it's actually at Boston that Samuel Snow rides up on a horse. It's not at Exeter. But, but this is where the message is empowered. This is where he declares that it's midnight and that he's giving the midnight cry. And that this is midway. This is what Ellen White refers to, not Exeter. And then, of course, um, we know that this is the, the great disappointment. This way over there. And this is the first disappointment. Now, we can connect this in 1844 to... 457 BC, right? So we had looked at that a little bit, and we're going to look at that some more uh, in the study in, in the midst of the week. But what, what happened in this movement is we came to recognize that this date and this date occur in the Bible, as well as this date and as well as this date. That is, all of these dates occur in the Bible. Who dies on the first day of the fifth month? No, it's Miriam dies on the first day of the fifth month. That, that's what I remember. I could be wrong. What? Fifth month. Yeah. Aaron dies on the first day of the fifth month? Okay, so it's Aaron. So the first day of the fifth month, Aaron dies. So we could take this date from Millerite history, and for the first time we start actually using these dates in a way that we hadn't. That is, we look at the scriptures and we find these dates. Now, in the book of Ezekiel, all of these four dates occur. That is, he begins prophesying on the fifth day of the fourth month. And this is going to be... So I'm going to put Ezekiel under here. So he's going to have this date, the fifth day of the fourth month, in 592 B.C. And it's, it's the fifth day of the fourth month. And it's also July 21st. Right? So that's that symbol we talked about, the 21st day of the seventh month, 217. Right? Now, he has, this is the first date in the book of Ezekiel, and this is the last date listed, right? So this is chapter 1, verse 1. This is chapter 40, verse 1. And this is a hidden date. That is, it says it's on the 10th day of Rosh Hashanah. Now, the Jews all interpret this as being the 10th day of the seventh month, but some translators and some commentators think it's the 10th day of the first month. And actually, I think in the movement, when we first looked at it, we thought it was the 10th day of the first month because it says the 10th day of, at the beginning of the year. But this is talking about uh, the 10th day of the seventh month. And it became a key to understanding the chronology of Ezekiel. So this is going to be in 573 B.C. Right. And this is in the 30th year of the Jubilee cycle, and this is going to uh, be the beginning of the 50th year of the Jubilee cycle. Now you can see they're 19 years apart, but this is in the fall, this is in the summer. So it's in the 30th year. Once you get to the 10th day of the 7th month, it's a Jubilee, and then the 50th year is going to begin. Now, Ezekiel also has uh, the first day of the fifth month, and this is a hidden date. And this is in um, 
Is it 27? Ezekiel 27? I always forget. It's going to be when the, the mocking... What's that? Yeah, so Tyre is going to mock that the walls of Jerusalem have broken down. Now, it just says in the first day of the month, and it doesn't say which month, but since Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem came down on the ninth day of the fourth month, naturally this is going to be understood as the next month. Now, we, we don't do this now, but in Ellen White's day, when they were writing letters, um, they would write something like, uh, the seventh instant, I-N-S-T. They would have this abbreviation. And they would, they would use that abbreviation to tell you on the 17th of this month, right? So there was a common practice, which we don't use so much, where people would be aware of the context of which month you're referring to. So you didn't have to write, you know, November 9th. You could just say ninth instant, I-N-S-T. And, and this is kind of what's happening in the book of Ezekiel. Since it doesn't tell us the month, we would have to assume the month, and the most likely month to assume would be the, the month after the walls of Jerusalem broke down. Yes? Okay, Ezekiel 26. Yeah, I, I knew it's, I, it's a couple of chapters after the siege. So Ezekiel 26, verses 1 and 2. And so we have... Um, that date in Ezekiel. Now that date in, in Ezekiel, it's going to be... Um, so when the walls of Jerusalem are broken down, this is going to be the first day of the fifth month. But that's going to be in 586 B.C. Right? So he begins prophesying here. He's going to be predicting the siege of Jerusalem when the siege of Jerusalem occurs, he's going to write down the date. It's going to be the tenth day of the tenth month. But the walls are going to be broken on the first, uh, on the ninth day of the fourth month, and on the first day of the fifth month, he has a prophecy about that. So uh, Tyre is symbolically is going to mock. Now it also mentions the first day of the first month. Now that's going to be over here somewhere. Um, I can't remember which year, and it's going to be a prophecy about Egypt. Yeah, it's, it's over here, yes. So it's going to be over here, 570. That's, that's what it is. And so there you're going to have the first day of the first month. All right. So you can see Ezekiel has 13 dates, but four of those dates are going to be in Millerite history, right? These four dates are all going to be mentioned. And of course, we have the first day of the first month um, in 1533 BC, that's going to be, be when they first start counting the months from the spring. So prior to that, the Jews just named the months. But when they come out of Egypt, God is going to say, this month, which is the month Aviv, which is now called Nisan, this month is going to be the beginning of months. And then he tells them that they have to prepare this lamb, that there's going to be this Passover, and so forth. So from then on, they begin to count, number the months. So the Babylonians don't number the months, right? And the Jews never numbered the months. But until the Exodus, they began to number the months. So when you get to the seventh month in the fall, even if it's the start of the year, that is, if you're starting the year in the fall, the civil year, you're still going to call it the seventh month, not the first month. You're not going to ever call the seventh month the first month. It's always going to be the seventh month. And, and there's one uh, chronologist who doesn't seem to understand that. That's Floyd Nolan Jones. He, he somehow thinks that they're going to number from the fall, and I'm not sure how he gets that. But anyway, so we know that these dates are symbols. And, and they're symbols in lots of different ways. So we know how many days from the first day of the first month to the tenth day of the seventh month. So if you're going to count the number of days here between these two days, we know it's 187 days, right? And if we take these numbers in these dates, so these are the four dates of Millerite history in 1844 that we have to note. That is, it's the arrival of the second message, the formalization, its empowerment, and then the arrival of the third angel. These are marked. 
We don't have any other major dates. There's dates in Samuel Snow's letters. There's dates when things are done. But these ones are the main way marks. And they're marked in Ezekiel. But if I add them together, so I take them as a number, 11, 54, 15, and 107. So I add these together, I get 187. Right? So we know that's not a coincidence. Right? right. This is something that, that God has done. Um, and we also get uh, the same thing in, uh, uh, in 457 BC that we can create uh, by taking the dates that are given there and adding them together, we get 187. So it's something very unlikely to occur, but it does occur in God's word. That is, these are dates in Ezekiel, or these are in God's word. They're also in Ezra. Yes, Stephen. Reverse. Yeah. Well, but even I don't know, man, that gives you 107. Okay? Yeah. But some say it's something just out in the first in reverse. Yeah. So if you add these, if you take 11 plus 45 plus 51, it will add up to this 107. Yeah. Yeah. And if you add 710. Yeah. Yes, so it gives you July 18th backwards, or it gives you the same three digits as this, right? And that's one of the things we, we, we have done that some people are still uncertain about. That is, we're taking numbers and we're, we're using them in ways. And now one of the, the objections that when we first started doing this that people would brought to me is, well, it was this thing, you can do anything with numbers, it doesn't mean anything, right? Of course, you can do tricks with numbers. You can deceive people with numbers just like you can with anything. Um, but these are not tricks, right? These are things that uh, occur. They can be verified, and it's not something magical. It just shows design, that God has a design and a purpose in doing this. Now, what would be his purpose? Why would God be giving us these numbers at this time to analyze in this way? Why do we need this? Can't we just have the Holy Spirit impress us that something is true? Um, so why does he give us these numbers? Okay, well, we could say palmoni, but what math is objective. So for me personally, I, I understand that we're subjective creatures. We, we feel things. We, we have confirmation bias. We have uh, you know, connections with other people. And we sometimes believe things because, well, it makes us feel good or we want to or I'll be accepted if I believe this or, or that or the other thing. And we, so I know with my own heart... I'm, I'm a subjective creature as much as I try to be objective. Is the sound cutting in and out? Or? Yeah. It is? Mm -hmm. it yeah, okay. Well, hopefully it doesn't continue doing that. Um, and I need something objective to test myself. That is, maybe I'm deceiving myself about something. Well, math is, is objective. That is, it can be measured. Uh, when we talk about something that's a proof... Well, proofs exist in mathematics. They don't really exist in many things. You know, we can have evidence, the preponderance of the evidence, but when you have a mathematical proof, it's something that can't be controverted. It can easily be examined. People can check to see if the math is correct. And now people will still, 
want to skirt around this, but for those who are studying to find the truth, we would have to recognize that the possibility, and, and the other thing about this date, is this date is also October 22, right? So we know that with the biblical calendar, the 10th day of the seventh month can fall on a variety of 30 different dates on our calendar. So when we think about the fact that it's going to fall, these two dates, the first one that starts Ezekiel, and the last one that ends Ezekiel, this one is earlier in the book in Ezekiel, but it's, it's, so it's technically the last vision he has. But the last one in the book, and the first one in the book, that they happen to be the, the fifth day of the fourth month, midnight, and the tenth day of the seventh month, that shows that Ezekiel is proclaiming the message of Samuel Snow. He's a type of Samuel Snow. So these numbers, these symbolic use of numbers, give us information that we can use to analyze scripture. Now, we need to be clear. There is nothing that is hidden in God's word that contradicts the plain reading of God's word. So when we look at mysticism, mysticism says there's a, a reading on the surface of scripture. This would be Jewish mysticism. And that's good for little children. But the wise they can see that the, what that surface reading is isn't true, and we have some deeper meaning, some mystical meaning that contradicts the plain reading of Scripture. And that is an error. Nothing that we find by, through Palmoni or through any other means of studying Scripture can ever contradict the plain statements of Scripture. Right? And that should be plain. Yes? So if you take 11 mm -hmm. plus 45 yeah. plus 51 and you add those together, you're going to have 96 plus 11. That's going to... Why are you adding 11 again? Because I didn't add it. I took 45 plus 51. Oh. That's 96 plus 11 equals 107. So that is these three dates, the, the second angel's message arriving, formalization, and empowerment, if reversed, are going to give you this number, 107, 10th day of the seventh month. Right. Okay, so how did you get 187? Because I added these numbers in the regular order and added 107. Mm -hmm. Right? That's one through you. Yeah, so, so these are very unlikely things to happen. Right? Once you, you've analyzed and you've done a few different calculations with numbers and they give you the same kind of information, you have to accept that that is design, that it isn't just uh, you know, a coincidence because it would be a coincidence of astronomical proportions. If we take that Ezekiel, all of these dates are in Ezekiel, two of them are actually the same dates in the Julian here as they are in the Gregorian here. And we also have, you know, four of 13 dates in Ezekiel in this line. You can figure out the odds, and it's, I, I can't remember what it was, but it's, it's in the billions to one odds, just that fact alone. And then if we take, well, if we could take these numbers and also get 187, that, that increases the probability as, as being extremely unlikely. So we start to get in the, in the realm of, the impossible to happen by chance. It would have to be design. And we have thousands of these things that are witnesses. So at that point, you know that this is beyond anything that could have happened through chance. I mean, they talk about life happening, you know, the probabilities of life. This would be in that same area. You know, the fact that we exist did not happen by chance, and this did not happen by chance. <clears throat> now, we, we also know that when we have been looking at these dates, more and more symbols have arisen. Now, this creates a problem. If we only had a few numbers as symbols, uh, the odds are you know, astronomical. But as you start to get numbers as symbols, 
Well, you're going to see more and more of these symbols, right? You're gonna, there's just more symbols, so you're going to see more and more. And so the chance that you're going to see some, some set of numbers come together in a, an unexpected way, uh, that becomes more common, except that we are provi providing um, or we are provided with a pattern in which these need to fit. And that's the line, right? So when we are analyzing these numbers, they're not out of context. You know, I was going to bring this receipt. So there was one day I had three different receipts that I had purchased things. And, and two of the things that I purchased had this number as the total. Well, it was $17.64. I had two receipts like that. And then a customer came into the guitar store and he bought some cables and his total was this. Right? So this, of course, is this number which is from 34 AD. You got the 504 years here to 538, and then you have 1260 to 1798. And this was discovered by me in 2014. And in 2016, I realized it was discovered by Johannes Koletsky in 2010. So in April of 2010, he wrote a paper and, and he had analyzed uh, these periods. So this would be. 2 times 252, and this is 5 times 252, and that equals 7 times 252, and we know that's one tenth of a 2520. And then 2016, Stephen and I had counted back this period of time, so this is going to be 1764 years, and we're going to count backwards. Stephen says, you know, what if you go backwards from there? Where do you come to? And it's 1731 BC. And this is the date that I had for the end of the chiasm of Joseph, which I'm not going to draw right now. But in that chiasm of Joseph, um, well, this is when Jacob dies. But Jacob is going to bless his 12 sons. So so the sons of of Israel, right? He's Israel. So he's going to bless his sons. And so this date was confirming our chronology. And, and it also had some other interesting features. And, and one of them is, well, if you go back here, because, you know, this is 538, we know we have these two here. And if you go back here, uh, 723 BC here is going to be this is going to be 756 years, which is um, 3 times 252, right? Yeah. Right, so that means I, I didn't quite write it in proportion. That's where... So we can see that there is this... Um, this proportion here. So that means this is going to be 4 times 252. And if we count here, uh, this is going to be, bring us to 1479. And there's going to be 252 years here. And this is also going to be 3 times 252. Right. Now this is where the Jews would take the two periods of seven years after uh, crossing the Jordan. It would bring you to uh, 1479. That is, you're taking 1493 and taking 14 years from there, and that's going to bring you to 1479. So you can see here this is like a sabbatical cycle, but you again have this 7 times 252. Now this number then, 1764, we've had around for a while, but it's only been recently that we can see some more significance regarding this number. Now we can see this number, just it's a part of Bible prophecy, right? It's, it's not some magical, mystical number. It's just giving us some information. But it's, it's just, it's not an ordinary number, right? It's, 
It's a number that's related to what's called Capricar's constant. Now, the last page of the notes that you have, that I've sent out, has a thing called Capricar process for four digits. So this is, is, is a very interesting tool that we've been given, and it explains some of the things that we've been doing. So I'm just going to explain how Capricar's constant works, what these operations are. And if somebody has a calculator, they can give me the answers to these. So if I just take any random four-digit number, I can do something with this number. I can order these numbers in order from highest to lowest. And then I'm going to subtract the same four numbers from lowest to highest. Now, if I do that, what's the answer to this equation? 8532 minus 2358. 6174. Okay, so 6174. Is that what it is? Yep. Okay. Now, I just picked, <laughs> I just picked a random number. Now, this number here is called Capricar's constant. Okay? That is, if you take any four-digit numbers and you do this, you will eventually end up with this number from seven operations or less. Well, this one, which I just randomly picked, uh, works out in just one, one operation. So let's take another number. So somebody just say one number, a one-digit number. Nine. Okay, so we got nine. Somebody else? Okay. Heidi? Eight? Two. Two. Okay. So we take these numbers and we put them from highest to lowest, 9862, and we subtract 2689, and we'll get a number. So what's that number? 7173. 7173? Okay. And then I would do this again. I would take these numbers, so I'd go 7713, whoops, 31, pardon me, because <laughs> highest to lowest. And then I'm going to subtract 1377. And what will I get then? 6354. 6354. And then I take 6543 and subtract 3456. Oh, excuse me, you're right, you're right. And I get 3087. OK. And then I take. 8703, and I subtract, whoops, 30, <laughs> and I subtract 0378, and I get 8352. 8, 8352. Well, we already done this one, right? Mm -hmm. So if we, we go the next step, we know that we're going to get. We have to put 8532 and then 2358, and then we'll get 6174. So this is one, two, three, four, five operations, and we've arrived at this number. And this will happen every time. And there's actually only 30 numbers you have to create to prove this, because you just need to have. Now, if I had all ones, that wouldn't happen, or all twos, right? So as long as there's one number that's different, this will occur. And uh, so. Um, there is uh, 8,981, I think it is, uh, numbers that will do that because you're not going to count the numbers less than 1,000 because these are four-digit numbers. And we're going to take out the nine where you have a single digit or, or, or whatever, and then you're going to end up with uh, that. I think that's the number, if I remember correctly. But, but the point is, this can be proven as well by three different number, 30 different numbers that have all of the different numbers that could be arranged in the different combinations. And so you can, you can prove this without having to go through 9,000 different uh, numbers, right? Now, what is this telling us, this, this constant? Well, it's telling us that numbers, when we have a different iteration of a number, it that is a different order, the same digits but in a different order, 
that they have the same meaning, right? That is, I can take a number such as Eight one seven, and can I say that this is related to July eighteenth? I can because I know I can order these numbers as one eight seven. So this is just a different iteration of the same digits, right? Now, now if I did it, I could say, well, going backwards, it's July eighteenth, but. You know, I still can take, you know, 871. I mean, obviously, I can't get July 18th here, but I know that it's going to be related to that, right? So this is July 18th. It's just in a different order. Same combination. Sa yeah, the same numbers, just a different order, same combination of numbers. Now, we were doing this in these lines of judges. So we had... Um, and, and we're going to see this in the story of Jephthah as well. Uh, we're going to see these numbers show up. Now, uh, so I'm going to leave that, the, the one thing that I want to show you, uh, from the story of Jephthah. But I want to refer back to uh, what Dwight presented this morning. So he had done a presentation, yeah, <laughs> where we had a date, um, and I'm going to use the date October 21. Um, it's going to be 3, 60, is it 330? What's the date? Do you remember? 332. 332 is going to be the end. This is going to be the first date. This is going to be when um, Alexander becomes king. 336. 336, right? Okay, so 3.30, what? Well, he said October 22nd. That would be the first full year. First full day. Yeah, the first full day, pardon me, that he is, is king. But technically, the day his dad dies, he's king, right? So, so I'm, I'm going to argue with him on that. Um, and then he said there was, uh, I'm trying to remember the number now. 4,617 days, and this is going to be to Alexander's death. Now, there's disagreement exactly about this because we do have an actual record that says what day he died on, and that's going to be the 29th day of the last, the, the last day of the month. And that date is going to be, so it must have been like can't remember. It was the second month, so the 29th day of the second month that he dies. It's recorded in this diary of Alexander, like not Alexander's personal diary, but of the people who were his scribe, who worked with him. So when Alexander dies, he just writes, the king died. <laughs> King's, king, king died, that's it. You know, he does, it's not a description of his death. It's, it's just... It's the date, the 29th day of the second month, the king died. And that's going to be um, June 12th. Yeah, it's June 12th. He's going to die. And the number of days from, from here to here, so this is going to be the 29th day of the second month. And, and this was the 19th day of the seventh month. It's going to be this number of days. Now we can see we had Capricar's constant, right. right? We had this number, 6174. So you can see it has these same digits just in a different order, right? This one goes here, this one goes here, this one goes here, this one goes here. But I just found it very interesting that we have that number show up in the reign of Alexander. Now, in this movement presently, we've been addressing Alexander in connection with the last president of the United States. Correct? Yes. Right. And 
And yet now we have this number here. We don't know what it means particularly, except that it, it asks us to pay attention, right? Now, it's interesting because you brought that thing, pay attention idea up many times. Now, when I was in university and I was studying Hebrew, uh, my Hebrew professor, Dr. Russ Nelson, um, he talked about this principle in scripture uh, that when they have a play on words or when they have something that's grammatically incorrect, it doesn't really make sense. It's, it's, it's so that we pay attention to it. It's actually a marker that we need to, to recognize. And when I started studying Leviticus 26, and it says, um, I will prolong to punish you seven for your sins, and people, you know, it says seven times, right? Um, and I, I pointed out to him, I went to him, and he's blind. He was blind at that time because of diabetes. But he could see the words in his mind, he said. And he, he said, you know, what you notice there is that the grammar is wrong. And so you need to pay attention. That's a symbol. And so what, what translators try to do is they try to take something that doesn't make grammatical sense. And they try to make sense out of it. Because you would not say, I'm going to prolong you seven for your sins. You're not providing any seven what, right? But the idea there is it relates to the sabbatical cycle. And one Adventist scholar, he's noted that uh, what happens in Leviticus 25 with the sabbatical cycle is an issue of the year-day principle. And if he had gone farther and looked at Leviticus 26, he might have noticed that that that's why we can take that seven in Leviticus 26 and say it's a period of time, but it's a symbol, right? So in Scripture, words can be symbols. And 2300, evening, morning. It's not evenings and mornings. It's evening, morning. That doesn't make grammatical sense. So it's telling you that evening, morning is a symbol. And it's telling you this isn't to be understood literally. So to be understood symbolically. So we have these symbols to draw our attention, to look deeper. But again, everything that we find in Scripture will not contradict the plain reading of God's Word. So, so this is an important principle, that these symbols, a date, becomes a symbol. 11-9, 9-11. And, you know, we have... You know, this 1764, right? All of these different iterations, they all give us the same meaning. They draw our attention to connect stories and ideas and verses. Just like when we look at a word in Scripture and we say, well, where is this word first used? And we go look and we see that there's a story there. And that story is going to give us information that's going to tell us about other stories where that word is used. Right? We call it the law of first mention. And so we look back and we can see where it's first mentioned in Scripture. And we'd say, well, the order of the books, that's arbitrary. You know, uh, you know maybe we could say Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those are, that's kind of a set by God in some way. But not really. It's man has ordered these books. And so why should what's in Genesis, the first time a word is mentioned, matter more than if it's in Ezekiel? Well, all of them do matter. But we can see that um, God is wanting us to understand the end from the beginning, right? So to look back at when a word's first used, this is a symbol. And we can take those stories, and it gives us more information. Now, often when you look at how well, the mystical Jews or different Christians study the Bible. It's very subjective. That is, they use some symbols, but they pick and choose, and they contradict the plain reading of Scripture. And, and the question is, how can we distinguish what we're doing from what other people are doing? How are we any different? Well, one is, um, in studying chronology, when I started reading all of this, and, and for years, I've read a lot of uh, Protestant uh, prophecy. Uh, you know, I've read 
lots of different Adventist prophecy too and how, how they do it and how they look at things. And I've noted that people force things to fit into some kind of pattern that they have come up with. And if there's any contradiction with God's word, the problem is with God's word, right? They don't care about things being connected to reality. If it fits their system and their idea, that's all that matters. And, and we can't do that. So we need to be corrected by God's word and by reality. You know, I can't put uh, the fall of Babylon somewhere in the Julian year 538 because we have a newspaper account, let's call it, that tells us exactly the date that Babylon fell. And if I'm going to say, well, it says on the 1843 charts it's 538, I need to understand why that's on there. Now, 538 is a symbol. You see it's twice on the chart, 538 B.C. and A.D. But it's in the Jewish year 538, the fall-to-fall -fall year that Babylon falls, because it falls on the 16th day of the seventh month after the year in the fall had begun. Okay, so, so we have these symbolic use of numbers, and we have all kinds of symbols that, that have been given to this movement. So we can analyze them. And I'm just going to do one that we analyzed already, we've talked about. And this is Hiroshima, right? We know that a movie came out on July 21st, so six days ago. And what's this movie called? What? Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer, yeah. So Oppenheimer, right? Now, this movie is about a guy named Oppenheimer. He's the main scientist who, who helped develop the nuclear bomb. And it's focusing upon the first nuclear explosion, right? And that's going to happen on July 16th. This is going to be in 1945, right? So there's different ways they name this. We could call it the Trinity Bomb Test. It's Alamogordo as well. It's the place, the location, right? So they have this bomb, right? Now, it's going to be detonated on the fifth day of the fourth month on the biblical calendar. So is that significant? Can we say that this is significant? This date from Ezekiel, this date that we have in 1844 for midnight, when we have this bomb being dropped, well, it's not dropped, it's exploded because this is uh, just a test. But they're going to explode this bomb on the fifth day of the fourth month on the biblical calendar. Is that significant? Because this is a symbol for midnight. Okay? Now, we have a symbol for midnight, which is July 21st. And we know in our time here, on July 21st, 2023, a major movie... However you spell Oppen, it probably has two P's, Oppenheimer or something like that. I don't know if the I and the E go the other way. Right. Yeah, so they're going to have this movie released on the symbol for midnight. Now, this bomb is tested on this symbol for midnight. Now, there's another major documentary about this bomb, which I watched on YouTube. And what they do is when they get to, to July 16th, they go to midnight and they say, July 16th, midnight. So they label this as midnight, right? Now, so this is a symbol. So what is this telling us to do? Dwight, what's this symbol telling us to do? Pay attention, pay attention right? So we need to pay attention. When we see this movie released on July 21st, 2023, we need to pay attention. That means we need to think about this story here, and we need to think about midnight in Millerite history, and we need to think about Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, because these are connected in some way with our history. Now, I haven't really spent time analyzing this date in our lines, right, in our, our present lines. It, it, it probably has some relation. I was, wasn't that concerned about it. Um, you know, this is the Friday before our camp meeting began. You know, so if we would have started our camp meeting on July 21st, I thought about it, but I thought, well, that's a little too contrived, right? <laughs> uh, 
But you know, July 24th becomes significant. Iran has some information about that. But I just didn't want to you know, pick July 21st. But God did by having this film released on this date. And they could have released it on July 16th, in, but I think they like the Friday for the blockbuster or something like that. So you know, they don't have total control over those things. Now we also know with this story of Hiroshima that this story here is the story of Ezekiel. But the story of Hiroshima itself is that you're going to have, on July 27th, uh, the, um, the declaration. What's it, what's it called? Um, Plotsdam. So Plotsdam Declaration. So this is going to be received by the Japanese, and they're going to reject it on July 27th. So we know that's from Ezekiel's prophecy. Uh, and this is a Gregorian date, right? And then, the next thing, that's, because they reject this, there's going to be this date, August 6th. And on August 6th, this date is going to be the 26th day of the fourth month. That is in 1299, the 26th day of the fourth month is July 27th on the Julian calendar. It's a Julian date there. And this is going to be Hiroshima itself. And that's the 217th day of the year. This date here, August 6th, is the 217th day okay, of the year our, on our calendar. Okay? And then um, they were going to drop another bomb on a place called Kokura. And they were going to do this on August 11th. Now they didn't, right? They looked at the weather forecast. I'm not sure why they do trust weather forecasts. Uh, but they looked at the weather forecast for Kokura and they said, the weather's going to be really bad, so we're going to move it earlier. So they decide that they're going to drop it on Kokura on August 9th, right? But when they go there, the weather's bad, so they have a secondary target called Nagasaki. And that's where the second nuclear bomb is dropped. Now this date here is um, July 27th, on the Julian calendar, right? That is, it's going to be 13 days after this date. Okay, makes sense? Okay, now this is going to be 15 days after. So if you think about uh, the prophecy of Josiah Litch, he's going to count 15 days from July 27th to August 11th. Yes? Okay. Yeah, so you, yeah, but you're mixing in another story, but I see what you mean. You know, we have these different symbols show up. But if you start to have too many symbols, they start to lose their meaning. These ones are all connected with Correct. Josiah Lich's prophecy. Right. Right? This one here, of course, is a symbol that we have for our history because we're repeating Millerite history. And then we know Japan is going to surrender on August 15th, right? So that's the symbol for the midnight cry, right? That's your midnight cry symbol. So we have this story of Hiroshima that addresses midnight to the midnight cry, the history that we are looking forward to, like not that we really want it to come, but it's forward from our time. We're not to midnight yet. And but yet it's Ill is being illustrated here. Now, we thought, of course, Midnight, Midnight Cry would be Raffi and Paneum and all those types of things, but we know that we're in a typical history. But these are symbols, and they tell us to pay attention. So when we have this occur, we have to say, pay attention. 
we are in the midst of something happening. Right. And, and so these, are, these symbols uh, cannot be ignored. Right? We need to think about them. So, you know, we're going to close with prayer here. And, and tomorrow I'm going to start using some of, the, some of the other tools that Iran had used. And I'm just going to show you some examples. Uh, we're going to see how, uh, and it's going to be also, because I want to do some of the things that I'm doing in the presentations of the judges, I don't want to take all that time in those presentations to do those things. So I wanted to explain Capricar's constant because it occurs in the story of Jephthah, which I'm going to be doing in the afternoon study. Um, so having that in place is important. And, and also the, what I'm going to present tomorrow is going to help us in the study dealing with Samson. So we need to know how to use these tools. We need to practice. We need to understand the principles behind them, that we're not, we're not doing magic and we're not looking for these symbols in our life to sort of help us make decisions. You know, if, if I go to buy... Uh, a car and it's, you know, Capricar's constant, whatever, that's 6,000, um, 6,174, right? And I say, well, that's, I'm going to buy that car because it costs this price. And, you know, doesn't mean it's going to be a good car, right? But that would be numerology, making decisions based upon numbers. That's superstition, right? Correct. But if I happen to buy a car, you know, and I find, you know, I get in the car and it's got, um, you know, 1,764,000 kilometers on it. I kind of say, well, that's interesting. <laughs> you know, that's 36 times, or 360 times um, 490. What, 176,400? That's 30, 360 times 490, right? Something like that. That would be the number of days in 490 prophetic years, right? So, but, you know, we're not going to make a decision because that car has that in the odometer. I must buy it. Uh, you know, I almost bought a guitar because it had a date of September 23rd, 2017, which is 777 days before November 9th, 2019. And I thought, that's interesting, but I didn't buy it. <laughs> I thought about it, though. <laughs> okay. So let's close in prayer. Mm. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, uh, we are grateful uh, for the messages that you have given us. And we just ask, Lord, that as we continue through this day, um, that your Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts. We know we need to pay attention to what you are saying to us. We sometimes take it a little lightheartedly, um, but we know, Lord, that this is a serious matter, that, that you are speaking to us and that you want to do something in us. And so I ask, Lord, that you can help us to, to truly pay attention in a serious way. We pray for each person. You know the decisions that we have to make each day and the trials and struggles that we face. So I ask that you can come close to each one of us that we can know that you love us. And um, we pray, Lord, that um, the work that you've begun in us, that you will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. And we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.